Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I shall be your reader today. Boats. Boats. Ahead of a boat, across the sea, there is always another land. There is land for a boat to come from. There is land where a boat will go. The ocean is empty and the ocean is wide, but still the sailors know on the other side is the land where the boat will go. There is always a land to come from and a land where the boat will go. Have you ever tried to think through the mind of a child? Of course, parents, teachers, and visiting grandparents <laughs> strive to do so all the time. I found that it's not that easy to do, actually. Now, today's author spent a long time with children when launching her children's book writing career. And boy, oh boy, <laughs> did she figure out what caught their attention and that brevity of words was a key to their imaginations. Thus, the poem Boats. But Margaret Wise Brown was far, far more than a fragile children's book writer about bunnies, toads, alligators, and tigers. In the January 31st, 2022 issue of the New Yorker magazine, writer Anna Holmes began her lengthy article entitled The Radical Woman Behind Good Night Moon with this note, quote, in his 2017 book about children's literature called Wild Things, Bruce Handy, contributing editor to Vanity Fair, confesses that he always imagined the writer Margaret Wise Brown to be a dowdy old lady with an ample lap, just like the matronly bunny from her classic story, Good Night Moon, who whispers hush as evening darkens a great green room. <clears throat> In fact, Brown was a seductive iconoclast with a Catherine Hepburn mane and a compulsion for ignoring the rules. Anointed by Life Magazine in 1946 as the world's most prolific picture book writer, she burned through her money as quickly as she earned it, traveling to Europe on ocean liners and spending entire advances on Chrysler convertibles. Her friends called her mercurial and mystical. Though many of her picture books were populated with cute animals, she wore wolf skin jackets, had a fetish for fur, and hunted rabbits on weekends. Her romances were volatile. She was engaged to two men, but never married. And she had a decade long affair with a woman. At the age of 43, she died suddenly in 1952 in the south of France after a clot cut off the blood supply to her brain. That was all that quote from the New Yorker in a very lengthy article. And I'll put the connection on, um, on the YouTube site so you can read it. Whew, my oh my, what a wild and woolly life that girl led, eh? And I was always convinced that Margaret Wise Brown was for sure the knitting grandmother in the rocking chair in my favorite book, Good Night Moon. <laughs> Guess I was wrong. But also in 1917, another 2017, let me bring us up to date, another writer wrote a longer story about the author of The Runaway Bunny, 
a book, actually, and a book that wowed the critics and adult lovers of Goodnight Moon with the fondest of childhood bedtime story memories. In 247 pages, today's author takes us on an enjoyable and comfortable, yet absolutely fascinating journey with Margaret Wise Brown. From her first lines of the book, quote, the moon and sky over Brooklyn, New York, was bathed in the golden hue of an aurora borealis in the early hours of May 23, 1910. The birth date of Margaret. To her last lines of the book, one who has dared to be gloriously good and gloriously bad in one life. No limbo for her. As a salute to Children's Book Month, today's reading is from the book In the Great Green Room, The Brilliant and Bold Life of Margaret Wise Brown. And the 2017 author is Amy Grant. But before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. In 1990, Amy Gary discovered unpublished manuscripts and songs from Margaret Weiss Brown tucked away in a trunk in the attic of Margaret's sister's barn. Since then, Gary has cataloged, edited, and researched all of Margaret's writings. Amy's work on Margaret has been covered in Vanity Fair, Entertainment Weekly, and even on NPR. She was formerly the director of publishing at Lucasfilm and headed the publishing department at Pixar Animation Studios. In addition to writing, she packages books for retailers and publishers. In that capacity, she has worked with Sam's Wholesale, Books A Million, Sterling Publishers, and Charles Schultz Creative Associates. Her biography on Margaret in the Great Green Room is published by Flatiron Books, a division of Macmillan, and it came out in 2017. The Huffington Post reviewer began her 2017 review with this statement, quote, Good Night Moon author didn't actually hate kids, but she didn't blindly paint them as little angels either. She concluded, however, with this quote, there could be creative value in an author looking at children not as an innocent monolith, but as highly articulated individuals with their own personalities, flaws, and conflicts. Amy Gary, captures the eccentric and the exceptional life of Margaret Wise Brown, like a big lovable walrus or a cozy furry bear for one of Margaret's stories. We're actually going to begin today's book in the Great Green Room <clears throat> uh, in 1934. That, if you've done your quick calculations, you realize that Margaret is now 24. Uh, and this is where life seems to begin for her in the meeting of the very famous Gertrude Stein. So let us begin there. Every seat in the auditorium was taken, but people continued to file in. Gertrude Stein had requested that only 500 tickets be sold to the lecture, but it appeared the struggling Brooklyn Academy of Music was reluctant to turn patrons away. Chairs lined the aisles and people perched where they could in the slivers of space that remained. The audience was primarily composed of women, although Stein's arrival in America had been widely heralded to all. Newspaper headlines and an electric sign in Times Square 
welcomed the famous author home from her self-imposed exile in France. The Academy was her first stop on a 37-city lecture tour. A radio interview, the only one she had ever given, had been broadcast two weeks earlier from NBC's studio. Margaret and another Holland's uh, alumna listened to the broadcast at Margaret's Greenwich Village apartment. They shared an admiration for Stein's work while at Holland's, her college, unlike most of the girls at the school who find the writer's work perplexing. Stein's repetitious style was meant to evoke clarity, but her use of minimal punctuation frustrated many American readers. In the interview, Stein claimed that punctuation crippled deep understanding of the written word. Margaret wanted to take colored chalk and write that theory all over the blackboard of the professor who had made her repeat freshman English. Both of the girls were living in New York and attempting to write for a living. Neither was succeeding. Her friend had sold only one poem and Margaret hadn't sold a single piece. Her work as a nanny and shop girl didn't cover her living expenses, but an allowance from her father gave her a comfortable enough life. Her apartment didn't have hot water, but she always had enough money to dine out, see plays, and attend lectures like the three that Stein was to give at the academy. Newspaper reporters took pleasure in taunting Stein's style in their pun-riddled copy, but the author's celebrity status and carefully orchestrated interviews drew enormous crowds to her events. Her first lecture was about her most recent book, The Making of Americans. In the semi-autobiographical novel, Stein chronicled three generations of a family. She described how the characters' personalities were formed by their choice to repeat the actions of their parents. Those repetitions shaped their own lives and the lives of their children. Like wave after wave, each generation was formed by the previous generation, which created a collective family culture. The next generation had the choice to carry on the family's culture or break away. Breaking away was difficult because it fragmented the family. Margaret had been deeply moved by Stein's book. It clarified her why her own family was so broken. Her parents' individual personalities had been formed long before they met and were influenced by their very different families. They once loved each other enough to overlook those difficulties, but now her father lived on his boat and her mother was alone in the house on Long Island. There were no plans for family gatherings on Thanksgiving or Christmas. Even so, Margaret missed the structure of holiday breaks and had been a part of her college life. She also missed her friends from college. The summer after she graduated, she served as a bridesmaid in four weddings. But as each friend left the church on the arm of her new husband, Margaret knew the couple was walking off into a life that eventually left her behind. The things she and her now married girlfriends once had in common would erode, especially when children came along. Before long, Margaret knew the letters that bridged her and her friends distance would cease and they would lose touch completely. She tried not to think too hard about the future and kept herself busy. There was always something to do in the city. She visited museums and took classes at the Art Students League in New York. Her instructor had her paint only color with no shape or intention so she could understand the moods colors could evoke. Then she molded forms with clay to get a feel for dimension. After days of that, she painted still lives and nude model after nude model. This soon bored her. She decided to save money by quitting the class and painting her own pile of fruits and vegetables. After that, she took a short story course at Columbia University, 
where Basil Rausch, her brother-in-law, law, was earning his doctorate in history. Basil was far too serious for Margaret's taste, but he suited her docile sister. Basil and Roberta lived close by and the sisters had become closer in recent months. Margaret teased Basil about his somber, dark brown tweed suits, and he considered an amusing challenge to find interesting dinner companions for Margaret. A parade of professors, writers, and editors were served at his and Roberta's tables, but Margaret found most of them too gentle and dreary. She had no trouble finding good-looking young men with more money than intellect to accompany her to plays, movies, and restaurants around the city. Inevitably, though, she would cast them off, too. They were fun, but unable to hold a decent conversation. She loved living in the city. At night, she lay in her bed and listened to the city grow so quiet, she could hear the click of heels on sidewalks and the shutter of the traffic lights as they change from red to green. She woke early to write and watch the city come to life. When she walked through her Greenwich Village neighborhood, she chatted with street vendors and shopkeepers around Washington Square Park. She helped the French baker around the corner with his English, and he gave her lessons on the French horn in return. Every week, she bought a bouquet of flowers to live in her tiny apartment. She loved how almost anything could be found in the city. In the depths of winter, she discovered white narcissus for sale in the subway. And for a few cents, she bought the memory of spring. The Great Depression still gripped most of the nation, but the Browns saw no changes in their lifestyles due to the economic downturn. Margaret continued to receive a healthy allowance, and the Browns went on vacation across the country and to Europe. On a family skiing vacation in Lausanne, Switzerland, Margaret met the pretender to the defunct Spanish crown, Infante Juan, Count of Barcelona. They dined and skied, and although their relationship wasn't serious, it was often mentioned by her family that she once dated the Prince of Spain. Margaret's father had grown tired of waiting for her to marry or find permanent work. He threatened to cut off her allowance and force her to move home if she didn't find a full-time job or a husband soon. Margaret was desperate to stay in the city. She confessed her hopes and exasperation in letters to her former English professor, Marguerite Hearsay. In one, Margaret shared her dream to write great literature, and in the next, was resigned that she might as well give up and marry a good man. Dr. Hearsay encouraged Margaret to continue to write. Her talent and literary foundation would eventually open the necessary doors. Margaret wasn't so sure. A year after graduating, she had convinced her father to pay for her to take a couple of graduate courses at the University of Virginia. There, she rented a charming house from Stringfellow Barr, a lauded history professor who allowed Margaret to sit in on his renowned literary salon. She made many editorial connections through Stringfellow and pressed her new friends to consider her short stories for publication. No one, though, wanted to pay, and she wasn't quite sure why. As Margaret sat in Stein's lecture, listening to the famous author discuss repetition in writing as a way to reinforce understanding, Margaret felt inspired. The author had stepped onto the stage in heavy, low-heeled shoes. She wore her signature long tweed skirt topped by a white collared shirt and black vest and approached the lecture without looking at the crowded auditorium. She launched into her speech and kept her eyes on the papers in front of her. For several minutes, she lifted her gaze, after several minutes, she lifted her gaze and asked the audience if they understood what she was saying. Polite nods assured her they did. 
This was particularly true for Margaret, who listened to Stein speak and instantly recognized the simple beauty of the great author's style. Stein's reliable rhythms created a cadence that bound the reader to the page. Repetition allowed readers to grasp a basic premise and then, by turning phrases over and over, successive layers of understanding were peeled away. Margaret realized that everything she respected about Stein's style was lacking in her own muddled work. Her short stories and articles were obtuse and elitist. She used her own privileged life as the basis for everything she wrote, while Stein's easygoing verse sprang from universal themes. Stein's language was clear and concise, but behind those unpretentious words lay complex meanings. Meanwhile, Margaret's writing was overblown and haughty. Before this moment, Margaret had believed that formality was what literature required. But now she saw how a simple approach was possible and even respected by critics. She grasped the mechanics and the deep emotional well of Stein's style and was electrified. She saw the same things in Stein's verse that she'd come to understand in nature and art. There was always something new to discover in both because our lives and perspectives were always changing. The same type of daisy she had picked and admired as a child was certainly similar to the one she might pick today. What changed was the way she saw the flower. This was true of great literature like Stein's. It endured because it opened the door for a reader to embark on an ever-changing road of self-discovery. For a long time, Margaret had felt like uncooked green peas whirling about in a pot, hoping to become a properly prepared dish. Now she was ready to write in a whole new style. She walked out of the lecture hall more determined than ever to become a writer of importance. Margaret continued to write and hone her style, but by the beginning of 1935, she hadn't sold a manuscript. At her father's insistence, she moved back home to live with her mother. Margaret distracted herself by joining what a group, with a group of fellow Long Islanders to start the Buckram Beagles, a hunting club. Its members and their guests gathered each weekend in the fall and spring to run for hours through the island's vast estates behind the hounds. Their prey was imported Austrian hares, a long-legged jackrabbit traditionally used in the sport. The hunt was capped by a dinner or tea on one of the estates, and Margaret was grateful for the opportunity to chat with these new friends, even though the topic always seemed to be the habits of rabbits. <laughs> At the teas and dinners that followed the hunts, the conversations were engaging, and Margaret met the most interesting people. She befriended a woman who had been the head of the Red Cross in France during the Great War, and the man who was heir to the Singer sewing machine fortune. He preferred to bend the rules of the sport by following the runners on horseback, but no one complained because they often hunted on his ground. Whenever possible, Margaret traveled with the club as it competed against other kennels in field trials around Long Island and as far away as South Carolina. She hated being at home with her mother, who was skilled at finding inane errands for Margaret to run. The next spring, Margaret escaped Long Island by finding work as a Libyan tutor through one of her beagling friends. Her charge was Dorothy Dot Wagstaff, a 12-year-old girl who had been sick and had fallen behind at her private school in Manhattan. Margaret's primary job was to make certain Dot caught up with her class and passed her end of year's exams. Dot reminded Margaret of herself at that age. 
The young girl had a keen mind, but like Margaret, hated sitting still to do her schoolwork. She would rather be playing with her dog or at the stables with her horse whenever possible. She didn't work efficiently and watch the clock instead of paying attention to what she had to learn. Margaret enjoyed finding ways to interest Dot in her studies. She also developed a reward system that encouraged Dot to focus her efforts intensely so they could go to museums, movies, or horseback riding. When they rode horses together, Margaret sang hunting songs, show tunes, and ballads. A song titled Abdul Abdul Bul Amir was one of Margaret's favorites. It told the mournful tale of two men who fight to the death in a battle of outrageous pride. Her recall of lyrics was impressive and she amused Dot with her performances while in the saddle. When Margaret discovered that Dot was an exceptional artist, Margaret taught her the technique she had learned at the Art Students League. Dot preferred to paint her horse and dogs instead of landscapes or people, but her knowledge of the animal's muscles and movements shone through in her art. At the end of the school year, Dot passed all her exams and Margaret was thrilled. Teaching could be exciting and most surprising of all, Margaret was really good at it. Another one of Margaret's beagling friends had recently earned her teaching certification through the Bureau of Educational Experiments or Bank Street, as it was commonly called due to its location. The friend praised the vitality and creativity of the school's progressive program. So Margaret filled out an application. She was accepted into the teaching college for their fall term and hired on the spot as a teacher's aide for a class of eight year olds at one of Bank Street's associated schools. Bank Street's founder was Lucy Sprague Mitchell, a brilliant, fast talking, chain smoking educator who had previously been the Dean of Women at the University of California in Berkeley. While at Berkeley, Lucy had grown frustrated that the only jobs available to her graduate students were as teachers or nurses, even with their advanced degrees. In 1919, when Lucy left the highest realms of education to start Bank Street, the courses being offered at women's schools were clearly inferior to the ones offered to men. Lucy believed that those less rigorous undergraduate classes kept women from meeting requirements to enter many graduate programs and thus advance in their careers. Until girls were held to the same demanding educational standards as boys, their vocational options would remain limited. Moving women out of their standard career roles and prescribed subservience in marriage would take time. Girls had to see themselves as equals and it had to be good, it had to be begin at the early levels of education. Boys also had to see girls as true peers and teaching methods needed to be reformed for this revolution to take hold. Lucy had studied theories on education and had been deeply influenced by John Dewey's grand breaking ideas. He believed education should be a cooperative adventure between teachers and students, and that collaboration would naturally foster equal minded children. Dewey held that children learned better through a hands on approach and proposed a less regimented curriculum that didn't force children to memorize mountains of information. Instead, a teacher was to be a facilitator instead of an instructor. They were to guide and encourage children as they learned. All children, he believed, were explorers on the greatest journey of their lives, that of childhood. Lucy admired Dewey's philosophies, but felt his methods required testing on a broad basis. Fortunately, Lucy received a generous inheritance and used it to find to found a school laboratory. Thus, Bank Street was born. Bank Street began as a center where psychologists and educators could test and share new approaches to teaching. 
It wasn't long though, before Lucy realized that math and science easily conform to a fair-minded classroom. What challenged her was finding children's literature that didn't subjugate women. Fairy tales often positioned marriage as the ultimate goal for a girl. Moreover, the violence and questionable morality of the characters in those stories were not appropriate for children. She needed literature that reflected children's lives in an even-handed way. The curriculum Lucy needed to support their classroom simply didn't exist, so she created it. By the time Margaret arrived at the school's front door, Lucy's textbook, a thick collection of stories and rhymes, had been used for more than a dozen years in progressive schools. Lucy labeled her book and the literature movement behind it, the here and now philosophy. Her writings met children at their own stages of development, where they were emotionally and psychologically at that moment. Children became more aware of the larger world as they grew. Two-year-olds' perceptions and interests differed vastly from six-year-olds. Stories about mother, father, bed, and breakfast were fascinating subjects for a toddler, but by the age of six, they were more interested in the outside world. They were not only curious about vehicles and buildings, but how they were made. Margaret walked into Bank Street as at the most opportune moment. Lucy had been hired to write another large collection of stories and poems in the here and now style for her publisher, Dutton. The last book had consumed an inordinate amount of her time and she knew, need, she, knew she needed help to meet the publisher's deadline. She was looking to hire an editor and author for their new production staff. Margaret's graduate writing courses, coupled with the psychology classes at Holland's, qualified her for an interview. Lucy was impressed with the pretty blonde girl's quick mind and spunk. On a hunch, Lucy hired her. And although it was a part-time job, Margaret's writing career was finally about to take flight. Margaret was thrilled to be earning money as a writer, even if it was for a children's textbook. Her days were packed. She woke early in the morning to write, then reported to her classroom of eight-year-olds at the Little Red Schoolhouse. There, Margaret read manuscripts to her class and others. She kept extensive notes on what captured the children's attention and what bored them. The children, too, shared stories, songs, and poems with Margaret, so she could home in on the words they used at each age level. Margaret hurriedly wrote down what the children said and then created lists of age appropriate words. She listened to the way they described the world around them and in their words, Margaret recognized flashes of true poetry. She was in awe of how naturally the children expressed themselves. Afternoons were spent at Bank Street where Margaret took courses necessary for teacher certification or chased behind Lucy sharing her notes on which manuscripts did or didn't work in front of the young audiences. It was soon clear to Margaret that her own stories lacked a certain spark. Her writing was stilted, not at all as effortless as a child's own language. It took a while for Margaret to understand what felt false in her simple lines, but one day she realized she was talking down to children in her writing. She was handing them a version of their world filtered through her words, emotions, and eyes. Somewhere along the way, she, like most adults, had forgotten how it felt to be a child. Books and music had helped Margaret escape the walls of her boarding school. Stories and songs had lifted her from her own troubles and transported her into a carefree world. That was what she wanted to do in her own writing. But adulthood had dulled those memories. Her senses, once so keen as a child, had a blanket over them. 
Even in recalling those days, Margaret was revisiting them as a grown woman with a different perspective. If she were ever to write honestly for children, she needed to be able to see the world as they saw it. Margaret became convinced that she needed to recapture the pleasures and frustrations of childhood. She returned to the fields and woods of Long Island and physically positioned herself to th see things from a child's point of view. She picked daisies, watched bugs crawl, and gazed at clouds floating by. But it was going to take more than seeing the world from a child's physical vantage point to capture those moments clearly. She had to experience as a child would, with a sense of awe and wonder. That was the real key to writing for children. She had to love, really love what they loved. When writing about a certain topic, Margaret would spend days studying the subject. When writing about farms, she drove to the north end of Long Island and picked potatoes in the hot summer sun. To write about boats, she spent days at the Hudson and East River docks, watching ships come and go, learning sailors' songs, and talking to the tugboat captains. She even paddled a canoe around Manhattan. She recalled her childhood days of walking on these same docks and the way the cargo and rivers changed with the seasons. She struggled to remember what it felt like as a young girl to watch her father sail away. She tried to recall her overwhelming fear that he would never return and also her joy when he came home with gifts from exotic lands. After studying every aspect of boats, sailors, and the sea that she could, she led a group of students that varied in ages to the same docks. She noted what impressed them, what generated questions, and what language they used to describe what they saw. On any given day, they might visit a skyscraper or she might lead an expedition to the zoo to watch the seals swim. The day after she wrote a poem on bees, she and the students buzzed around the classroom together, pretending to be bees. Once Margaret realized she needed to be writing about the world from the perspective of a child, ideas for stories and poems seemed to simply flow out of her. She often woke with a head full of them and had to scribble them down before they left her head again. When she completed her manuscript, she immediately brought them to the classroom to be tested. Children were ready and honest critics if they weren't concerned with pleasing the adult who was reading to them. And she never told them she was the author. She knew they would pretend to like, to like it to spare her feelings. If given the chance, children were quite capable of detecting minute flaws in a manuscript and pinpointing where a story went astray. Margaret soon learned that if she watched their eyes and looked for their jaws to go slack, it meant she had succeeded. In their imagination, they were no longer in the classroom, but it stepped into the world of the story. It wasn't serious literature, but Margaret's talent impressed Lucy, who offered her co-authorship on the Dutton Reader. Lucy found that all she needed to do was steer Margaret toward a subject and she could write about it. Lucy may have created the here and now style of writing, but this girl gave it wings. The job at Bank Street allowed Margaret to move back to the city. She shared an apartment with a friend in a townhouse on West 10th Street in Greenwich Village, across the street from where Mark Twain once lived. On weekends, she hunted with the Buckram Beagles, if weather allowed. A friend that lived across the hall was a fellow Beagler and a Spanish socialite. She helped smooth some of Margaret's brusque social tendencies. Margaret's mind raced and she frequently forgot much of what someone had just said to her. Margaret dedicated herself to giving all her attention over to listening when someone else was talking. She was dating Charles Cork, 
the grandson of the founder of Holland's and brought him to dinners at her sister's home. Even Basel approved of the gentle, kind man. He was an engaging conversationist and like Margaret enjoyed everything the city had to offer. They went to plays, museums and restaurants. She envisioned how her life would be if they were married and living in Virginia. She thought he might make her happy, but she worried about what living so far away from New York would mean for her writing career. In her desk drawer, Margaret kept a collection of notes and ideas for picture books or stories and poems that wouldn't fit in the reader that she and Lucy were writing. Before the end of the year, Margaret had drafted manuscripts for almost a dozen books in various stages of Polish. Before leaving on a beagling trip to Virginia, she impulsively stuffed a couple into an envelope and sent them to an editor she had recently met who worked at Harper and Brothers. Since 1917, the National Beagle Field Trials had been held in Aldi, Virginia. On the 500 acre farm, the Buckram Beagles hounds competed to improve their club standing and the breeding value of their beagles. Foot racers for the hunters were also held. The Buckram's beagles didn't bring home any titles, but Margaret won her race, earning her the title of the fastest female runner in the sport. After the field trials, Margaret went to Richmond and ran into a fellow Holland's alumna. The girls took an impromptu trip to their old school to attend Sunday chapel. Once on the Hollands campus, she also went wading in Carvin Creek, picked dandelions and saw the first robins of the spring. Margaret was tickled to run into a former professor who feigned alarm at seeing his ex-students, nicknaming them bad and worse. It delighted Margaret that she was labeled only the bad. The visit to Holland's invigorated Margaret and renewed her soul. She was happy enough with her life. She had become close friends with the other teachers and writers at Bank Street who had nicknamed her Brownie. She was especially close to Edith Posey Thacker, another teacher and Rosie Bliven, a Bank Street volunteer. Rosie and her erudite son, Bruce, regularly invited Margaret to their literary gatherings in their apartment. Rosie was well-connected in New York society and Bruce was a remarkably talented writer. He and his friends were some of the most prestigious young writers in Manhattan. Margaret sometimes joined jazz revelries playing with more passion than talent, but her band members didn't care. <laughs> it was all in fun. Margaret's life in the city was full and interesting, but being in Virginia away from the city's hectic pace reminded her that New York wasn't the only place she could live. She wondered if settling down somewhere like Virginia would doom her chances of being a writer. Stepping back into a place you loved didn't necessarily mean you weren't moving forward. And she really did like Charles. Maybe she could be happy being married and living near Holland's. Margaret's vocation came to an end with these questions swirling around in her, mind, head, in her head. Despite her doubts about her future, the young teacher returned to work on Bank Street, feeling strong and invigorated. The vacation had renewed her and she was quite proud of her national championship as a runner. Another triumph was soon hers too. While she was away, the Harper editor had read her manuscripts and had loved her writing. Waiting on Margaret's desk upon her return was a letter offering to publish one of her stories as a picture book. Best of all, the editor asked to see other stories Margaret had written. Before long, Margaret held her first advance check in her hand. She headed for the bank, glancing at this little piece of paper that made it official. She was an actual author. She had been writing poems and stories for the Dutton Reader, another here and now storybook, but that was part of her job at Bank Street. It wasn't a separate book that earned royalties and will be illustrated in full color. 
this book would have her name printed on the cover. Margaret stopped at the flower cart near her apartment for her weekly bouquet. The apartment's living room walls were painted the same bright green as the library in her family's home, but lacked the luxuries of that house. It was old and cold. There was no hot water for a bath, but Margaret liked being on her own again. Seeing the profusion of color and scents on the flower cart thrilled her. It was spring in the city once again. She looked down at the check in her hand, and then up at the flowers. She was now a real writer. She hoped there would be many more book advances in her future, but there would only be this one first advance. And she wanted to make it memorable. She wanted to celebrate. She decided she'd throw a party unlike any other and convince the vendor to take the check in exchange for delivering the entire cart of flowers to her apartment. By the end of the year, Margaret had a book advance from another publisher for a collection of stories, poems. It was enough to pay for a trip she had long wanted to make to Ireland. She was eager to see the land of her ancestors, but her father had refused to let her go alone. She coaxed Roberta into coming along by arranging for her to receive an advance as the illustrator of the book. Most likely because Basel would join them, her father approved of the trip. Margaret planned to write and visit art museums in London for two weeks prior to meeting Roberta and Basel in Paris. Her plan went astray on the ocean liner as it crossed the Atlantic. On the boat, Margaret met a charming group of young men who asked her to join them on a bicycle trip along the coastline of Cornwall. It was the best way to really see the land, they promised the adventurous Margaret. She bought a bike when the boat docked and followed the boys. They stayed with farmers and fishermen along the way and found pubs in every hamlet. Their haphazard planning didn't always assure comfort. One night, Margaret's makeshift bed was a bathtub. She woke with a very sore neck and vowed to plan her travels more carefully. It was, though, a glorious trip, much better than traveling alone or with another girl. If her father had known his daughter was traipsing unchaperoned through the English countryside with a gaggle of boys, he would have been horrified. It certainly defied convention, but anyone of literary merit wouldn't have turned down an adventure like this. Nor would he or she have stayed away from the pubs, where cider and conversation with the local villagers made for colorful evenings. This was the England she had pictured. Kind farm people, dark pubs, fields of heather and stone that disappeared into the sea and fog. This felt like a pilgrimage, and she, like a real author, on her last evening on the coast, she walked through a fine rain as it drifted over the granite-topped hills of Dartmoor in North Bovey. Dusk was setting in. She was alone on the rocks except for the occasional bunny or sheep that materialized out of the waves of mist blowing over the heathery land. The farmhouse where she was staying wasn't far. She would be there before dark. Over the past few days, she'd grown close to the couple who rented her a room in their small country house. They shared warm dinners and hours of conversation with their American guest. Margaret was delighted each time their orphan pet calf mooed at the back door for milk. Kittens, dogs, and geese wandered the farm too. It was the most relaxing place. And Margaret hoped to stay there for three more days, writing and painting. As she walked along the moors, she wondered about her future as a writer. Just thinking about her deadline sent a twinge of anxiety down Margaret's spine. She really should have finished the book by now. Snippets of poems were coming to her, but they were far from sonnets. They were merely ideas without solid purposes or form. She still wanted to write something serious, something literary. Margaret thought that perhaps a course in playwriting could help her step out of the children's literature world. 
learning a new way to write might unlock her ability to write for adults. But as the English mist swept around her, she reconsidered. The problem wasn't her style of writing, she realized. It was that she couldn't think up anything of importance to write about. Maybe she should stop writing altogether and just grow up. She wasn't sure how to do that though. Growing up seemed to be something that happened rather than something that was done. Margaret headed back toward the farmhouse. The bicycle trip had been impulsive, but it had led her on a wonderful journey. She felt, felt stronger than she had in years and she wanted to ride her bike around Ireland. Maybe she would ride it to Paris to meet Roberta. She didn't know where she could stay between here and there, but she had faith that the winds that blew her to this corner of England would see her safely south. After meeting Roberta and Basel in Paris, they went to the International Exposition of Arts and Technology in Modern Life, which was being held near the Eiffel Tower. Countries from around the world displayed their latest inventions and art and pavilions built especially for this world's fair. The swastika of Hitler's political party marked Germany's exposition, but its menacing shadow had only begun to cast darkness over Europe. Margaret was fascinated by the modern art she saw on display in the French pavilion. Long ago, she had learned what, that art was a window into every era. As she visited medieval castles in their ancient land, she scribbled notes on scraps of paper. Try as she might, she couldn't separate her modern view to imagine life inside those walls centuries ago. She promised herself to visit art galleries more often on her return to America. Perhaps by seeing the changing world through artists' eyes, she could better understand history and her own place in the world. When Margaret came back to work at Bank Street, she found that Lucy Mitchell had been busy starting a writer's collective called the Writer's Laboratory. As a member of the publication staff, Margaret was automatically a part of the group. The other members had been handpicked by Lucy to write for Bank Street's publication division. Its members met each Wednesday to review works in progress and discuss the results of manuscripts that had been tested in front of children. Lucy was a good human and enthusiastic coach who helped the writers tailor their words to the interests and language levels of their desired readers. She critiqued their work through plumes of cigarette smoke while sitting on a worn green couch. All the members considered these productive sessions a rich reward for having survived Lucy's courses on grammar. Lucy also found Margaret another new part-time job Lucy had convinced Bill Scott, the parent of a Bank Street student, to start a publishing company to produce books based on the school's literary principles. Lucy provided office space in the Bank Street building and suggested that Scott hire Margaret as his editor and principal writer. Scott's aim was to produce unique children's literature that did not copy what had been done before. Exploring new ways to make books appeal to Margaret's sense of adventure too. She saw so many opportunities in this field that even though she desperately wanted to write something more serious, she considered it her duty to make certain juvenile literature that was set on the right course. She settled in as editor at William R. Scott, Inc and was proud enough of the letterhead that bore her name and title that she pasted multiple versions of it into her scrapbook. Bill Scott's family, mostly family-run operation, published five books in 1938. His wife, Ethel, wrote one of the books, and her brother, John McCullough, acted as the company's editor-in-chief. The small publishing company published The Boundaries of the Standard Book, adding textiles and textures, writing from unique perspectives and inviting accomplished fine artists to try their hands at illustrating for children. Margaret had learned a great deal about editing and publishing during her time at Bank Street. And she brought everything she knew to Scott. Her mind was always searching for new ways to engage children through books. 
And fortunately for her, Bill was bold enough to try most anything she dreamed of. One of their first books was written by Margaret's friend and Bank Street alum, Posey Thacker. Margaret wrote another two of Scott's first books, edited all of them, and found illustrators willing to work for low fees. It was standard for publishers to pay artists a flat fee for their work, and the fledgling company was on a tight budget. For Bumblebugs and Elephants, one of Margaret's books, she found an excellent artist through her friend, Montgomery Monty Hare. Monty had attended college with an artist named Clement Hurd, whose work Margaret saw hanging in Monty's bathroom. She loved Hurd's style and wanted to call him right away, but Monty knew he had no phone. Instead, Monty and Margaret headed over to his apartment in a rundown Greenwich Village building. One where all was cr cr crumbling and made the place feel like a war zone. Margaret was fairly sure from his living conditions that she could afford to hire him. <laughs> and she was right. The next day she was training Tim to illustrate for children. That summer, Bill and Ethel Scott invited their staff, illustrators, and writers to join them at their Vermont farm to brainstorm ideas for their next list. Dogs roamed around as their owners reclined in chairs or hammocks and on the soft green grass. Margaret had an idea that didn't want to appear too eager. She had recently heard a broadcast of Gertrude Stein comparing the nursery rhyme, a tisket, a tasket, to one of her own writings. It dawned on Margaret that Stein might be interested in writing for children. She proposed they contact Stein. Everyone agreed her idea had merit. Being able to list a literary giant as one of their authors would be a coup for any children's publishing house, especially a small one like Scott. Other office, office, authors whose styles might work for children were suggested. They also wanted to contact Ernest Hemingway and John Steinbeck, whose descriptive but simple writing styles would easily adapt to children's literature. At Bank Street, Margaret led workshops for writers and teachers on how to write for children. She was certain she could coach established writers how to tailor their work successfully. Margaret was sure that if a Stein or Steinbeck stepped from adult books to children's, the questionable designation of their here and now books would disintegrate. Those hard to please critics and self-important librarians who showed such disdain for their work would not dare dismiss a children's book by Stein or Hemingway as pabulum. Fortunately, most librarians, book buyers, and reviewers were impressed with Scott's first list of books, and sales were brisk. Even so, Bill was worried about his company's future. While the library market did not return books, it was customary for bookstores to return unsold copies to a publisher. The Scott's Barnes served as their book warehouse, and some of these returns were making their way back to Vermont. No one was sure how many more copies would end up back in the barn. Returns were not something the fledgling company had accounted for. So Bill needed to reset the estimated earnings and reduce expenses on further publications if they were to survive. As a favor, Bill asked Margaret to agree to a reduced royalty on the books she wrote. She loved working with Scott and believed they were changing the landscape of children's literature. They were her friends, so she agreed. In a small operation like Scott's, everyone had to pitch in any way they could. One of their first books, Cotton Tales, had been printed on cloth with cotton tails sewn on to the illustrated bunnies. I didn't have one of those. But the tails on the bunnies weren't attached firmly enough and they soon began falling out of the books. Margaret had not been able to sew straight stripes on a sorority sister's pants, but she was handy enough with a needle and thread to tack the cotton onto the bunnies' tails alongside the rest of the staff. Margaret was delighted that Bill liked her idea 
to contact established writers. She longed to meet Stein. How marvelous it would be to work with her literary hero and tell her how instrumental her works had been in shaping Margaret's style. Bill, though, tasked John with approaching each of the authors. If the writers responded, then Bill himself would work directly with the authors. Margaret was crushed, but she agreed to help craft the letters. John told Margaret this was a fruitless venture. He bet her a set of box seats at the Metropolitan Opera that none of the authors would, would respond. Margaret felt certain they would at least hear from Stein. She took him up on his bet. Margaret also spent part of the summer off the coast of Camden, Maine, with fellow Bank Street staff members Jessica Gamble and Tony McCormick. Tony brought her two sons and piano along to the spacious old house on Vinyl Haven Island. The rambling cabin, Sunshine Cottage, was rustic, but that didn't bother the married band from Lucy Mitchell's ranks. Even the bats that occasionally made their way into the upstairs bedroom and bath couldn't spoil the mood. A rowboat and a sailboat came with the rental of the house and Margaret and her friends explored the series of islands dotting the shoreline off Long Cove, the slough where the house was situated. They had a marvelous time getting to know the locals, exploring the forests and islands and picnicking anywhere that struck their fancy. Margaret's book, The Fish with the Deep Sea Smile, had been published earlier that year by Dutton and dozens of glowing reviews were sent her way. The Streamlined Pig was about to be published by Harper and Brothers, who asked her to think of a suitable non de plume for her books with them. She was already published by Dutton, had been contracted by her friend Al Leventhal at Simon & Schuster to write a series of Disney books. It was suggested she use a different pen name with each publisher. And Margaret liked the idea of having unique names for her different writing styles or age specific works. She hoped to come up with pen names that had hidden meanings like Mark Twain and was considering Darnell as a last name because it was one of the grasses used by Shakespeare's King Lear to create his own worthless crown when he went mad. Like Timothy Grass, it also turned gold at harvest time, the same shade of gold as Margaret's hair. One afternoon, the trio found themselves in a predicament. Jessica had experienced a panic attack as they were rowing back to their rented house and insisted they pull the boat to shore. She hopped out and peered back at Tony and Margaret from behind a spruce tree, convinced that if she got back into the little rowboat, she would die of a heart attack. The situation was growing dire because the sun was setting and walking through the thick forest back to their rented house would be treacherous over land dotted with granite quarries. Margaret and Tony tried to appease their terrified friends saying that they would row along the shoreline, but to no avail. Fortunately, a large boat was cruising by and came to their rescue. At the helm was Big Bill Gaston a handsome man with a ruddy face. He looked at the woman. He felt no urgency to speak and Margaret was suddenly self-conscious about her appearance. She was wearing a torn sweater and blue jeans. She typically took pride in her worn clothes and even had a name for them, Boops. But under this man's gaze, she found herself wishing that she had worn something more attractive for the day's adventures. Bill introduced himself, although Margaret already knew who he was. The tragic suicide of his wife, Rosamond Pinchot, earlier that year had made front page news. Many of the reporters placed the blame on Bill, whom they described as a womanizer. Bill offered to give Margaret and her friends a lift and to tow their boat. It took a great deal of persuading to get Jessica off dry land, but they boarded the boat and Bill fixed them rum and Coca-Colas. Margaret watched him as he moved about the boat and talked with her friends. He appeared gracious and amiable, not at all the callous philanderer that the reporters had made him out to be. She liked his directness. She desperately wanted to make an impression on him, and when they discovered they had a friend in common, 
Margaret nervously chatted on about the fellow. She immediately regretted placing more importance on that friendship than it warranted, but there was something in Bill's eyes that excited and aroused her. She wanted him to like her. Bill came by the next day to take Jessica and Margaret sailing. He moored his boat and they swam to a small island with a white pebble shore. Lying near the great expanse of sea, they talked openly about their lives. The pretenses of adulthood were wiped away and it felt like they were teenagers again. They played a game of telling secrets, pretending they were talking of someone else, but really sharing stories about their own lives, hopes and dreams. Jessica confessed that she had dated a New Yorker once who was so wealthy that policemen stopped traffic when he drove her downtown. They had been able to speed straight through all the red lights. Margaret told them about a man who threatened to shoot himself if she didn't marry him, but then didn't. Bill wished life was just one long prom with boys in tuxedos and girls who never grew older. As the days passed, Bill served as their local guide. Maine had long been his family's summer residence. After the death of his wife, it served as a haven for himself and his boys and their nanny. He had a comfortable home situated prominently above the water on a private island in the middle of the slough where Margaret and her friends were staying. For years, a steady stream of celebrities, politicians, and friends flocked there to swim in the calm waters around his island and dance under the stars on his outdoor ballroom floor. That summer, only a few of his friends came to visit, so he often sought time with Margaret alone. He made dinner for her at his home and took her for cruises on his luxurious boat to gaze at the stars. Tony was not fond of Bill. Once Bill invited the three of them over for lunch and had promised to pick them up at their dock at one o'clock. They dressed and sat waiting for over an hour, but he never showed. Tony said Bill drank too much and was wrong for Margaret. But it didn't matter what she said because Margaret was already too much in love with him. When Margaret returned to New York, Bill called her every day, begging her to come back to Maine. At the end of the summer, she hopped on a train to Rockport to go see him. But when he arrived, he was nowhere to, she arrived, he was nowhere to be found. On the platform, there were groups of people kissing hellos or directing their chauffeurs to their luggage. But Margaret stood waiting, unsure of what to do. A cab driver saw her anxiety and offered to help with her bags. She declined. Bill would be there soon, she hoped. She thought she saw Bill slouching her way, but was mistaken. Had she gotten the time of day or day wrong? She looked up and down the platform again. The cab driver was waiting to see this final desperate sweep of her eyes. He sidled in, gripping one of her bags firmly and asked where she needed to go. She told him to take her to the docks. As the cab crested the hill, Margaret was Bill, saw Bill tying off the stern of his boat. Relief washed over her. He hadn't forgotten after all, the cab driver unloaded her bags and walked them to the boat. Margaret barely noticed. When she faced Bill, the rest of the world disappeared. It's as if there were only two people on an island. She loved how he looked in his casual summer clothes with his sun brown skin. She could tell he was excited to see her too by the way he smiled up at her every so often as he tied ropes and placed bumpers around the boat. They walked from the dock towards town and into a store that sold canned goods, meats, and an assortment of homegrown vegetables. It smelled of stale crackers. Old women from town shuffled around the store and over Margaret's head hung flypaper strips too full to be of any more use. The place charmed her. As they walked back to the boat, Margaret felt the gaze of the small town's gossips upon them, but she didn't care. She breathed in the mingled scent of scalp and salt water. She loved that smell. She and Bill untied the boat and set out to sea. Margaret stood on the boat watching the water and land around her. A bell buoy clanged on a distant wave and a fish hawk wheeled above her. She saw its nest of sticks nearby in the top of the old dead tree. 
Moss hung from the tree's branches, reminding her of the trees in Cumberland Island. She told Bill it looked like a tropical island. He promised to take her to a place with green moss, giant skunk cabbages, and blue irises all around. She would think she was in a jungle. The ride was choppy and Bull had, Bill had to steer the boat into the waves to keep the spray from the white caps away. Margaret wanted to sit next to him on the captain's seat, so he gave her a hand up. They held on to each other as the boat was lifted high by one big wave and then dropped back into the sea. Bill promised it would be smoother sailing once they turned the point. Margaret felt secure in Bill's closeness on their perch above the ocean. He turned the boat into the channel of islands. It occurred to Margaret that these patches of land and trees looked disconnected on the surface, but far below they were the same land. The trees, rocks, and ocean valleys were all one, standing together against the endless waves. People were like these islands, she thought. They live separate lives, but underneath they're all connected. They seek comfort and support through others. No one really stands alone. Margaret nestled in closer to Bill, thrilled to be in her arms, in the fresh air and on the exciting seas of her beloved Maine. One final poem of Margaret's. Eyes like emeralds in the road tell the presence of the toad. Eyes like rubies in the dark catch the alligator's spark. And tigers, tigers burning bright in the stillness of the night. And thus, the less dramatic part of the book <laughs> and how she finally made her way into publishing and her enormous success until her passing in the early 1950s with some of the greatest children's books I think ever written. I suggest you read the rest of the book. It does get a bit racy uh, after this page. There are only 237 pages in it and I, I got you up to page 87. Um, so you've got a lot left to read, but it's a remarkable life of someone who, as I quoted earlier, who just lived it to the full, was great at everything and did everything bad she wanted to as well. So it's a lovely book. And I suggest you go home and read Good Night Moon one more time. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little bit about next week's book. As always, we make a, a little bit of a switch here. We're going to salute Another event this month, uh, other than Children's Book Month, is a salute to the Asian American Heritage Month. Asian American Heritage Month. And I've chosen a book by a gentleman I met actually in Boston uh, 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 at a lecture. Um, the name of the book is The Sympathizer. And the name of the writer is Viet Thanh Nguyen the winner of the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for fiction, as well as seven other awards. The Sympathizer is the breakthrough novel of the year. With the pace and suspense of a thriller and prose that has been compared to Graham Greene and Saul Bellow, The Sympathizer is a sweeping epic of love and betrayal. The narrator, a communist double agent, is a man of two minds, half French, half Vietnamese army captain who arranges to come to America after the fall of Saigon. And while building a new life with other Vietnamese refugees in Los Angeles, is secretly reporting back to his communist superiors in Vietnam. The Sympathizer is a blistering exploration of identity and America, a gripping espionage novel and a powerful story of love and friendship, says the New York Times book review, a remarkable debut novel. I hope you'll be with me next week. It's a marvelous book uh, written by a, a marvelous Vietnamese American writer. Um, so join me, please. 
And thank you for watching today. If you enjoyed this video, please, please press like it uh, and consider sharing it uh, with your friends. Also feel free to uh, write a comment. Um, we love to hear from people with suggestions for books that they would like us to read. I also encourage you to uh, subscribe to the Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel to stay on top of all of the great content. So much going on as we go into the summer. Thank you again. I hope you enjoyed the story, that piece of the story of such a wonderful writer as Margaret Wise Brown. And once again, do read Good Night Moon tonight. Take care. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>